PhD course uh, obviously open to everyone. Uh, philosophy as a method of thinking practices. Today, we have the great pleasure to host here Professor Keith Robinson from the University of Arkansas at the Little Rock. Keith is the author of a book very important for our pers perspective, Deleuze, Whitehead, Bruxon, Rhizomatic Connections. Luckily for us, he will deepen today this theme, talking about, it's the title of his speech, Abstract Life, Practices of Abstraction in Deleuze, Whitehead, and Bergson. Keith had a doctorate in UK and has taught in many universities, both in England and in the US. His research concerns three main areas. The so-called continental philosophy, that means Nietzsche, Foucault, Deleuze, the process uh, philosophy, James, Bergson, Whitehead, and the interconnections between these two areas. His uh, researches perfectly fit our goals and interests in this moment and in this seminar. And uh, we are looking forward today to hearing his talk, please. Well, thank you so much, um, Professor Fabricasi. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I'm delighted to be here and to be able to talk to your group. Um, so I'll jump straight in. Um, in his lectures on Kant, Gilles Deleuze tells us that once you reach the abstract, you reach the most fully living core of experience. True lived experience, Deleuze says, is an absolutely abstract thing. Abstraction is a fundamental process of life. It's not opposed to the concrete, but is the becoming concrete, the concrescence, um, the wonderful English word that Whitehead resuscitates uh, of reality. So in what follows, I will argue that Deleuze, Whitehead and Bergson share a similar approach to abstraction, an approach that's fundamentally pragmatist in a very broad kind of construal of, of pragmatism, um, close to James Williams gave in this lecture series a few weeks back, a wonderful talk on what he called fantastic pragmatism. So the conception of, of pragmatism that I think underlies these three thinkers' work is close to, to what James was arguing there. But leaning on William James, one name for the shared approach is radical empiricism. And I think John Stewart talked about this in the first lecture. And he's best understood in my view in the context of process philosophy. So although these three, three thinkers share a similar approach, I will point out some differences between um, their radical empiricisms in the way they think about some of their key abstractions. So for example, Deleuze on relations and the notion of the and, Whitehead and Bergson on time. But all three thinkers give us abstractions for thinking life as the creation of the new. So the first section then, the, the abstract image. In the Western philosophical tradition, the key image for thinking the abstract is the taxonomic tree of classes, kinds, and types. One moves up through levels of generality to the highest abstractor, and then down to ever more concrete particulars, instances or tokens. Perhaps our best known example of this is the movement of the dialectic that Plato associates with Socrates. One must track down the higher forms or ideas in the things which participate in them, ensuring that the lines are pure and unmixed. This procedure operates in accordance with the fixed classes and divisions of the tree and is guided by the question, what is X? 
One of the first examples of this in Plato is in the Phaedo, where Socrates shows his interlocutors how unequal sticks or logs communicate with the equal itself. In contrast, the radical empiricists construct a different kind of abstract space, more rhizomatic, to use a term drawn from Deleuze and Guattari, anterior to the up, down and high, low of the platonic tree, compelling its components into movements of endless divergence and continuous variation. In place of starting with abstract forms and asking how they are realized in the world or extracted from it, the radical empiricists ask under what conditions something new comes into the world. Rather than a process of extracting a pure form or emptying a space of its concrete content, Deleuze, Whitehead and Bergson rethink the notion of the abstract as a living practice of philosophical thinking, a mixing and growing together of abstract elements in which the and, Deleuze, or actual occasions in Whitehead, or durations in, in Bergson, create a line of variable direction that describes no contour and delimits no form. That's a little quotation from Deleuze and Guattari's A Thousand Plateaus. So there are, there are then at least two types, models or practices of abstraction. So the first type begins with Plato and behind him there's Parmenides and the whole Eleatic tradition and remains more or less in place in much of modern philosophy, at least for our three thinkers. I'm gonna call this type um, spatial abstraction. Spatial abstractions tend towards stasis, separability, identity, and the discrete. The second type is associated with the radical empiricists, and it could be traced back to what Deleuze calls a, a, a set of minor traditions and thinkers, um, but primarily, I think, historically Heraclitus. And there's a whole bunch of other thinkers besides as well. We might think about some of the classical pragmatists and some of the post-structuralists. But I wanna call this second type temporal abstraction. So temporal abstractions tend toward change, relationality, continuity, and difference. These two practices of abstraction do not exist apart from each other. So they're not oppositions as such, but inseparable forces or tendencies towards stasis and change that work within in the experience. Every experience to some degree expresses both types. However, for the most part, for the radical empiricists, Western philosophy has favored practices of abstraction of the first type at the expense of the second. So the basic principle at work here I argue for the radical empiricists is that philosophical problems conceptualized in terms of spatial abstractions must be rethought and rearticulated as temporal abstractions in order to avoid all kinds of what Deleuze calls illusions, Deleuze and Deleuze and Guattari, or fallacies in the case of Whitehead or false problems in the case of Bergson. And towards the end of the paper, I'm gonna say something more about um, how they think about these notions and whether they're equivalent, or whether there are differences between them and how they function. So the second section then I have just a short introduction to Deleuze and Guattari and the, the concept of the end in their work, just to give you a flavor or a taste of how they work with these kinds of abstractions. Um, so in Deleuze's work and in his collaborations with Guattari, one way that this gets worked out is in terms of what they call a thinking with an. Deleuze and Guattari claim that philosophy is encumbered with the problem of being, 
of the abstract is. So what is this problem? The problem of being is the idea or the dogmatic image, as Deleuze calls it, of taking what is represented as all that there is, of taking the image of thought for the whole of thought. So a simplified version of this is that the world consists of independent individual beings, things or substances that are embedded in space and time. And so on this view, things are individuals because they have spatio-temporal location. They are the subject of the predication of properties. And there are properties, some properties that distinguish one thing from another. Perhaps the key claims are that relations exist, but they require a lata. That is things, beings or objects that stand in relation. And that these things must have properties that stand over the relations. Therefore, there must be things in themselves. This metaphysics is internal to thought, a default or illusory image, enabling the recognition of itself and things. Now, this, uh, this description that I've just given of the metaphysics of, of the years, um, let's say it's an abstraction. Um, in Deleuze and Guattari, the way I've um, articulated it, or it's at least an extrapolation. Um, much of their work, much of Deleuze's work, talks about this in terms of um, notions of recognition, um, of common sense, of good sense, and so on, um, which they carry through, Deleuze carries through in, in various books. So this is kind of an extrapolation from that much more detailed um, and complex articulation of, a, of, of the dogmatic image of thought. Okay, so what I'm doing here is sort of extrapo extrapolating from that. So Deleuze and Guattari problematize this metaphysics of the years with a dynamic relational ontology of the end, in which there are no things in themselves with intrinsic properties over and above the relations in which they stand. As Deleuze says in an interview, you see, I don't believe in things. It's a wonderful quote. I think. Um, relations by definition are not in themselves. They are external to their terms, as Deleuze and Guattari say. They are rather in between. For the end, it is relations all the way down. Deleuze and Guattari try to effect a decisive break with the ultimate spatial abstraction, the verb to be and its attributes. So that finally is yields to end. As Deleuze says, and this is a quotation, um, wonderful quotation, I think, empiricism has no other secret, thinking with and instead of is. It's quite an extraordinary thought, and yet it is life, end quote. So in several texts, Deleuze and Guattari explicitly contrast the is and the and, and connect this to a new type of empiricism. For example, in his dialogues with Claire Parnay, Deleuze says that, quote, in Hume, there is something very strange, which completely displaces empiricism, giving it a new power, a theory and practice of relations of the and, End quote. And the end is always um, capitalized in these quotations. So the new power that Deleuze speaks of here is the autonomous power of relations freed from their subordination to the is, freed from the verb to be. As Deleuze says, quote, when you see relational judgments as autonomous, you realize that they creep in everywhere. They invade and ruin everything. And isn't even a specific conjunction or relation. It brings in all relations. There are as many relations as ands. And doesn't just upset all relations. It upsets being or the verb, end quote. In short, one must actually practice, they say, a thinking with and, instead of thinking is, instead of thinking for is, 
So in other words, when Deleuze and Guattari propose to, um, well, reverse ontology is one of the translations, and you can also say overthrow ontology. Um, and there are subtle differences between these ways of translating it into English. Um, they have in mind a certain conception or an image of abstract static being and its attributes that, that acts as a ground or a foundation and a network of presuppositions for an explanation of what is. As Deleuze says, quote, all of our thought is modeled rather on the verb to be, he is, end quote. For Deleuze, the history of philosophy is encumbered with the whole problem of being in itself and the question of the isness of things. Philosophers, Deleuze and Guattari say, discuss the judgment of attribution, the sky is blue, and the judgment of existence, for example, God is, which presupposes the other. But it's always the verb to be and the question of the principle, end quote. If the dogmatic arborescent image, um, as Deleuze and Guattari describe it, with its tree-like structures and branches imposes the verb to be on thought, it is through the rhizome image subterraneously operating through the conjunction and, 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 with the ellipses between um, the ends that make, that thinking makes its escape. Um, they say this conjunction and, they claim, carries enough force to shake and uproot the verb to be. So as Deleuze and Guattari put it, quote, the point is to move between things, establish a logic of the end, overthrow or reverse ontology, do away with foundations, nullify endings and beginnings, end quote. And they follow that up by saying, that's how you practice pragmatics. So I'll just, I'll just leave that there as a kind of introduction to Deleuze and Guattari and how they work with this new sort of affirmative conception of, of the end as a way of um, giving us a new image of what thinking can be freed from um, what they call the dogmatic image, what I've described as the, as the metaphysics of is. I want to do something similar in the next section with, with Whitehead and then the next section with, with Bergson. Um, so the third section then uh, I'm going to start talking about is the section on Whitehead on um, actual occasions and the becoming of continuity. So this really relates to um, the concept of time and how Whitehead and Bergson together rethink the notion of time. Although, of course, the end is another way of thinking time. The idea of continuity of the end um, of pure relationality is a, a notion of, of temporality of pure time in, in Deleuze, in Deleuze and Guattari. Okay, so this sense of pragmatics and the idea that the abstract does not explain, but must itself be explained is as Deleuze tells us, derived from Whitehead. For Whitehead, the explanatory purpose of philosophy is often misunderstood. Philosophy, Whitehead writes, is explanatory of, of abstraction and not the other way round. So again, you've got this kind of reversal going on here. As with Deleuze, philosophy for Whitehead must be the critic of abstractions, revising them as we go. One key spatialized abstraction that requires critical revision for Whitehead is what he calls famously simple location. Simple location underpins an entire image of thought in which, quote, we have mistaken our abstraction for concrete realities, end quote. We can explore this idea in relation to what is Whitehead's best known temporalized abstraction, the actual entity and how it is explained in relation to becoming and continuity. So I'm going to try and make this as, as clear as I can. I know some of you aren't familiar with Whitehead. Um, but of course, you can ask me questions about it as well. Um, 
So in both science and the modern world and process and reality, Whitehead describes time as a becoming of continuity. It's a wonderful phrase, becoming of continuity. And it is Zeno, and I want to argue William James, who provides the guide for thinking about the notion of the actual entity, its temporal nature, and the way it functions in terms of notions of becoming and continuity. So I want to say Zeno and James provide the guide. The structure of continuity can be traced to the condition of time, since its general function in Whitehead is to mediate between past and future. For one element to be continuous with another, it must conform to the immediate past and anticipate the immediate future. However, as a formal whole, the experience is given as a unifying epoch or indivisible living presence that doesn't have temporal extension. This is Whitehead's and James's response to Zeno. So as Whitehead puts it, and so this is a, um, some of these quotations I think are really important. If we admit, so this is a quotation from Process and Reality. Um, uh, if we admit that something becomes, it is easy by employing Zeno's method to prove that there can be no continuity of becoming. There is becoming of continuity, but no continuity of becoming, end quote. So units of experience or actual occasions become, and they constitute together an extensive world in which only extensiveness becomes, but quote, again, really important quote, becoming is not extensive. So becoming occurs within the process, but the act, within the actual occasion occurs all at once in a kind of Jamesian fashion. At least this is what I want to argue. So it occurs all at once so that reality grows for Whitehead, just as it does for James, by, quote, buds or drops of perception. So as such, as, as drops um, and buds, Time cannot be thought as a continuity. So um, it's a becoming of continuity rather than a continuity of becoming. As Whitehead says, and again, this I think is a really important quotation, quote, temporalization is not another continuous process. So he says this really explicitly. Um, so right at the heart, of the discussion of what actual occasions are, he's arguing that there is this apocal atomic structure, which isn't extensive. Temporalization, he says, is not another continuous process. It's an atomic succession. Thus time is, a, is atomic. And then in parentheses, he says, i.e. apocal, though what is temporalized is divisible. End quote. So Whitehead arrives at this position, I argue, as a result of his analysis of Zeno. Uh, if we analyze the act of becoming with the premises that something becomes, and the very ev and the every act of becoming is divisible into earlier acts of becoming, then we end up in the contradiction of an infinite regress where nothing becomes. Infinite regress leads to a contradiction in the notion of becoming, because if the act of becoming is itself temporally divisible, it cannot act as a synthetic unity for something to become, but must itself be subject to further acts of becoming. Fundamentally for Whitehead, no movement or process of reality can be self-constituting if it's subject to the temporalization of view of becoming. Indeed, as Whitehead puts it, quote, these conclusions are required by the consideration of Zeno's arguments, end quote. So I, I just think this is fascinating. I think this is something really crucial going on right in the, right at the moment in process and reality where Whitehead is constructing 
this abstraction, this famous abstraction of the actual, the actual entity, you have the appeal to Zeno as a pro that, that Zeno's paradoxes are fundamentally problematizing for the way in which Whitehead wants to think about the actual entity. And so going forward, you might think about how, say, Bergson's going to approach this. It'll be very different ways of approaching um, Zeno and thinking about the nature of these problems. So Whitehead, and I don't think this has been looked at enough in the literature, in the scholarship on Whitehead, that Whitehead takes Zeno very seriously. And I think his response to Zeno is by leaning on William James. And so this is how he gets out, if you like, of the Zeno problem. He gets out of the problem presented by Zeno by appealing to um, William James's notions of a species present um, and the notions of the actual occasion as a kind of drop or bud. So what I've, what I've tried to do in the paper is I've tried to set this up as an argument in terms of two philosophical moves. So I'll just quickly gloss those and then I'll move on. So we can summarize Whitehead's argument for the becoming of continuity in two key philosophical moves. So the first philosophical move is Zeno, what, what Whitehead calls Zeno's valid argument. So Whitehead argues that although some of Zeno's paradoxes are mathematically inadequate, with some modification, one can find, for example, in the arrow paradox, a valid argument. The valid argument I've already given to you, but let's just thought, so the first premise, in a becoming, something becomes. Second premise, becoming is divisible into earlier and later phases that go on indefinitely. Conclusion, therefore, nothing becomes. And this is the argument that, that worries Whitehead. So he takes it very, very seriously. So his response then, the second move, um, second philosophical move, Whitehead's response to Zeno's valid argument is to, I argue, generalize James's notion of the specious present beyond the stream of consciousness to all actual occasions. So James's notion operates on the basis of an intuitive duration within a non-extended or momentary act of awareness. So for Whitehead, the deployment of the specious present is a solution to what we can call the paradox of becoming, found in Zeno's valid argument. It's a solution because with this move, actual, actual occasions can be construed as becomings whose data can be synthesized and unified in an epoch without infinite regress. So that's what I think worries Whitehead um, in the construction of actual occasions. It's the problem of indefinite becoming, the problem of infinite regress. We could even say the problem of the and, of the and, and, and that goes on indefinitely. So fourth section then Bergson. Bergson's going to have a very different kind of response to this problem. So Whitehead's response here can be usefully contrasted with Bergson, who argues that the key to processual time is the continuity of becoming. The continuity is construed in such a way that the paradox of becoming is for Bergson a false problem. Bergson's continuity of becoming is based on a rejection of what I described as Whitehead's two key philosophical moves. So firstly, Bergson rejects the first philosophical move, what I call in the text P1. Bergson's challenge is directed, if not at the validity of Whitehead's argument, then at the truth of its premises. So the premise that something becomes is directly challenged by, Whitehead, by Bergson's conception of, of duration as a pure movement without an underlying thing that becomes. The premise that becoming is infinitely divisible is for Bergson to treat becoming in terms of a mathematical instant or a geometric point. These latter are spatialized abstractions 
good for utility, but not for speculation. And in the conclusion, I'll come back to this kind of distinction. The sort of thing that uh, James Williams talked about, a kind of narrow conception of pragmatism, and then a much more kind of broad conception of what pragmatism could be, a much more creative conception. Secondly, Bergson rejects P2. So duration is an indivisible continuity that doesn't require a non-temporalized atomic act to hold it together. Rather, as, as we shall argue below, temporal features of becoming, continuity, heterogeneity, in short, qualitative multiplicity, give duration its degrees of intensive unity and synthesis. At the beginning of Western metaphysics, Bergson claims it is Zeno who by drawing out the contradictions of movement and change, quote, led the philosophers, Plato first and foremost, to seek the true and coherent reality in what does not change, end quote. But why did they turn to what does not change? For Bergson, it's because these philosophers believe that in its ordinary operations, perception and consciousness operating with spatialized abstractions deliver change and movement to us. From there, it can be shown easily that change leads to insoluble contradictions and the creation of the paradox of the coming. Zeno's paradoxes for Bergson all attempt to show that movement and change lead to insoluble contradictions, but all trade on an illusion whereby real movement is confused with immobilities or static self-identical units. For Bergson, this is because we associate the movement with the line or the spatial trajectory that comes in the movement's wake. As Bergson puts it, Zeno's, quote, Zeno's illusion arises from this, that the movement once affected has laid along its course a motionless trajectory on which we can count as many immobilities as we will. From this, we conclude that the movement, whilst being affected, lays at each instant beneath it a position with which it coincides." End quote. So what Bergson means here is that we think of movement and change in terms of immobile states that are pieced together to constitute the change or movement. Although we talk about change, Bergson thinks that we quote, reason and philosophize as though change did not exist, end quote. This is, what spatial, this is what Bergson calls spatialization and has been the source of much confusion and misunderstanding, um, not least on the part of, of Whitehead. And there's a whole kind of history to this that goes all the way back to, to Bertram Russell and with some of the earliest critics of, of Bergson. Um, that Whitehead misunderstood, in my view, aspects of Bergson's spatialization is clear when Whitehead says that, quote, Bergson went further and conceived this tendency as an inherent necessity of the intellect, end quote. Whitehead goes on to say that he doesn't believe Bergson on this point. However, spatialization cannot be an inherent necessity of the intellect for Bergson because it would undermine various aspects of his own thought. For example, intuition could not get off the ground if spatialization were an inherent necessity because intuition relies in part upon tra a transformed mode of intellectual activity. In addition, Bergson's claim that the intellect has evolved and continues to evolve 
and spatialization is a product of that evolution would not make any sense. So the whole of Bergson's thought is grounded in the claim that there are no inherent necessities in the universe. In fact, I, I think it's Del Deleuze. Really, we could aim Whitehead's comment at Deleuze. I think it's Deleuze and Deleuze and Guattari who argue that um, you know, there are necessary or transcendental illusions um, that are an inevitable part of the intellect, right? I mean, that in a sense is what the dogmatic image of thought is. And it's deeply embedded um, in our thinking. Um, so I would make distinctions here between Bergson and Deleuze, and then Whitehead again, and I'll come on and talk about that. So it's intuition in Bergson that struggles with spatialization. Deleuze has stressed that intuition is a method in Bergson. It is, as he puts it, quote, one of the most fully developed methods in philosophy. Um, thus, as a fully worked out method, intuition ought not to be contrasted with intellect as such. Rather, it should be contrasted with the habitual and spatialized modes of intellect. Intuition is a labor or an effort to discard the common sense forms of intelligence tied to the spatializing abstractions of utility in favor of new fluid forms of conceptuality capable of engaging the immediate data of consciousness. The immediate data or content of intuition is of course durée. In response to Zeno and P1 above, Bergsonian change needs to be conceived as pure mobility without a self-present underlying thing or substratum that supports the change. And this is what duration is in part. Perhaps the key feature of duration is that it's an indivisible continuity and so this continuity cannot be conceived as a succession of self-identical and externally related units. Rather, without distinct elements, there is just the continuity or flow of becoming. As Bergson puts it, quote, this indivisible continuity of change is precisely what constitutes true duration, end quote. So this leads me to the second key feature of duration. It is heterogeneous. So it's this feature that challenges and overturns um, P2, the, the second part of um, Whitehead's response. By showing how a multiplicity of elements in becoming form a temporal unity. In other words, if the continuity of becoming implies creativity, novelty, and the new, there must be qualitative or heterogeneous differences in the continuity. Some may claim that an indivisible continuity of becoming eliminates distinctions between the phases of duration, but this would be to confuse an absence of divisibility with an absence of difference. So Bergson's suggestion here is that there appears to be a contradiction between continuity and heterogeneity, only if we insist on understanding the terms in mathematical, in a mathematical sense or quantitatively, or in terms of certain uh, presupposed logical principles. I mean, maybe in Whitehead's case, the principle of, of, of non-contradiction. But clearly Bergson wants to get at experiences that resist, resist translation into mathematical or arithmetic or presupposed rational terms. So one of Bergson's favorite examples is our experience of a melody. In listening to a melody, we have an experience of a change that endures. Although the tone, the pitch and the timbre might be the same as a second ago, what enables novelty to emerge is that the antecedent phase is still there, providing a qualitative difference in our experience of past and present. 
plus continuity and heterogeneity of becoming are fused in the experience of the melody surviving in the past and emerging in the present. Equally, when we think about our own inner life, Bergson says, there is no ego or self which functions as a substratum upon which a succession of states pass. Rather, quote, there is simply the continuous melody of our inner life, a melody which is going on and will go on indivisible until the end of our conscious existence, end quote. So again, these are, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of introducing this, I'm making the assumption that um, many of you won't be familiar with, with um, Bergson and Whitehead, so I'm trying to um, just introduce some of their very basic ideas and then perhaps in, in discussion we can, we can say a bit more. Um, in this final section then, so I'm coming on to the final section, I've been talking for just on about coming up to about 40 minutes. So I'll be talking maybe for about another 10 minutes or so, um, and then I'll, I'll finish up. So in this final section, I want to draw out some differences and some comparisons between what I've said of, between the three thinkers. So all three of our philosophers are um, radical empiricists, let's say. Um, that is, they are committed to the methodological dictum that the abstract does not explain, but must itself be explained. And all three are committed to the idea that life in the form here of, let's say, relations or the temporal is an expression of the abstract. But they do this in different ways. So perhaps these differences between Deleuze, Whitehead and Bergson are a reflection of their differing critical diagnoses and their creative responses, which take in their methods and approaches to uh, metaphysics and empiricism. So Bergson's true or superior empiricism, as he sometimes calls it, is premised on a movement of subjective experience or intuition that takes one inside the thing so that one might know it immediately and absolutely. As Bergson says, we enter into these states of a thing, its becoming and continuity through an effort of the imagination guided by intuition. This movement and sympathy what Bergson calls the inner life of experience is the unrepresentable movement of the abstract. Although, of course, you know, this is what Bergson is trying to, in a sense, articulate or express with these abstractions. Although this movement is a simple act, Bergson emphasizes the extreme difficulty of this effort because for each object of intuition or duration, one must cut a concept for that experience. So the way I describe it is that Bergson's empiricism is a kind of custom metaphysics that tailors the concept for each experience rather than utilizing a ready-made garment off the peg. Um, I hope you can follow though, those kinds of um, English expressions, custom metaphysics and off the peg. But if not, I'll, I'll explain them if you need, if you need me to. Um, for, Deleuze's philosophy um, for Deleuze's philosophy's task is transcendental empiricism at one point, as he calls it, indifference and repetition, is defined less by Bergson's arduous labor of the intuiting subject and more by a violence that thought is itself subject to or must undergo. The dogmatic image of thought is internal and constitutive to thinking itself. It essentially takes es essential differences and explains them through spatialized abstractions of being one and the whole, each with a capitalized letter. 
this is more than simply the error of mistaking the abstract for the concrete. In Deleuze's deeper renewed sense of the abstract, the end must force relations outside everything, which could be determined as being one or whole. As Deleuze writes, quote, one must make relations the hallucination point of thought, an experimentation that does violence to thought, end quote. So this forced and experimental displacement to an outside is the condition for the construction of a field that produces experience. Such a field or plane cannot be traced from the empirical in terms of identities or spatialized abstractions, but is directly expressed through passive syntheses, temporal abstractions which act as so many ends that constitute qualitative relation, movement, and continuous relation. As Deleuze and Guattari say, quote, such a plane is perhaps a radical empiricism. Notice the perhaps there in the, in the phrase. Such a plane is perhaps a radical empiricism. The cease, ceaselessly modulating end of pure relation communicates with quote, the flashing world of intensities, differences, differences of differences, and differences between differences, end quote. So that there are no relata or transcendent things in themselves. In this sense, only when immin imminence is imminent to itself, as Deleuze and Guattari say, can a new plane of thought be created. In his last work, Deleuze simply says, quote, we will say of pure imminence that it is a life and nothing else, end quote. However, the key idea here is that the plane is surrounded by illusions, illusions that are necessary or inevitable. A life is concealed, covered over, in its actualized forms, or the end is inevitably concealed by the is. So for Deleuze, we must go beyond experience and raise ourselves, or at least ordinary experience, and raise ourselves to transcendental lived conditions. Access to such conditions is via the shock of an encounter or an event that affects what um, Deleuze and Guattari, or Deleuze calls at least, a counteractualization or a counteraffectualization of the is. So the shock of an encounter produces an event that gives form to a virtual that eludes actualization in being, is how we might describe that. In contrast for Whitehead, Spatial ab abstractions like simple location are caught up in what he calls fallacies. These fallacies are errors and mistakes. They're accidental errors of subjective thinking. They're merely contingent and external to thought as such. Um, they're raised to a level of abstract presupposition that characterizes a philosophical and scientific epoch. In response to this, Whitehead's empiricism is more indirect, speculative, and approximate, making use of off-the-peg concepts, but modifying and, trans and transforming them in accordance with experience. So language and concepts are stretched beyond their ordinary use to generate ever more refined descriptions of the larger generalities. So Whitehead's radical empiricism can't take us directly and immediately inside experience um, as we get in Bergson, because it constructs a, a set of general concepts for a mediated and relative interpretation that asymptotically approaches the real. Although we are to keep renewing these concepts, descriptions and interpretations, 
to, be, to believe they give us the final reality or anything like the absolute is, um, Whitehead would say, folly. As a set of descriptions and interpretations that are re revolve around the thing ad infinitum, rather than entering into it, Whitehead's empiricism, um, in Whitehead's empiricism, the imaginative effort or leap doesn't produce a shock to thought or take us inside the experienced thing, but is directed towards conceptual creation guided by a set of principles that enable the generalization of specific notions beyond their immediate field of application. So one key component of Whitehead's speculative method is that it relies upon what he calls a rational side that places constraints on how we understand the empirical content. Although Whitehead is critical of the dogmatism involved in beginning with axioms, which are supposedly clear, distinct, and certain, and then building a deductive system upon them, speculative philosophy is still guided by what he calls, quote, logical perfection, end quote, and, quote, speculative boldness must be balanced by complete humility before logic. Now, that's a quotation from um, process and reality in the opening sections. I mean, that seems to me to be at least in tension with, um, certainly in tension with, with Deleuze, and I think in tension with, with, um, with Bergson as well. Um, and um, this, this might be something in Whitehead that's really interesting. It, it could well be a tension in Whitehead's own work because there are other places in, in Whitehead's work where he's not very interested in contradictions. He just thinks they're not very important. Um, so there may well be um, a kind of tension that runs through Whitehead's work here, which maybe we can talk about. So Whitehead appears to utilize the principle of non-contradiction non in the way that he thinks about Zeno to reject the continuity of becoming. But what if our best empirical observations and descriptions are in tension with or resist logical perfection? In contrast, Bergson's empiricism can more readily support an ontology that conflicts with a priori reasoning because it follows the contours of the real in search of a unique intuition. And it does so by avoiding one of the great illusions fostered by the intellect that we can think the mobile by means of the immobile. Thus Bergson can say that Zeno's arrow presents a valid argument only, quote, if we suppose that the arrow can ever be, and he italicizes that, can ever be in a point of its course, valid only if we presume that the movement of the arrow coincides with the position which is immobile. But Bergson says, the arrow never is in any point of its course, end quote. To think that the arrow is at a point in its course is as Bergson says, to cut the course in two at this point and make two lines out of one. So it's a, it's a different movement. The illusion, as we've seen, consists in applying the movement to the line traversed, but this possibility exists only for a detached observer who posits so many possible steps along the line and then tries to reconstruct real movement with these immobilities. This illusion is part of Bergson's critique of what he calls the logic of solid body bodies and what he calls the cinematographical method and is carried right through into the notions of identity and contradiction. The contradiction disappears, Bergson says, when we place ourselves inside the movement and adopt the continuity of becoming through intuition. For Deleuze, we cannot place ourselves inside the movement through intuition as such, 
but we must be compelled or provoked into thinking in order to problematize the abstract illusions of the dogmatic, dogmatic image. In the encounter, we experience the indirect effects of the virtual or duration and must fashion a concept for that experience. So in short, Deleuze's abstractions are the product of an encounter um, or a shock or an event that opens up the lived depths of experience. Whitehead's metaphysics is a set of abstractions for indirectly plumbing those depths. Whereas Bergson would have us plunge in and immerse ourselves in the real. So that's sort of the end of the, of the paper. I mean, essentially, the, the key idea, I think, is that what I'm trying to suggest is that all three thinkers in one way or another are trying to present a new way of thinking about thinking, um, a new way to think about the notion of abstraction. And I'm kind of reminded of that um, Heidegger quote that Deleuze often uses or occasionally uses, the quote from Heidegger where Heidegger says what um, the, the most thought-provoking thought thing about our thought-provoking time is that we're simply not thinking. And Deleuze often uses this kind of quotation. Um, and I think all these, these three thinkers are trying to um, get us to think in new ways about the notion of, of what thinking could be. So maybe that is um, another sense of, of the pragmatic, a sense of um, expanding what thinking could be. All right, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was uh, so profound and full of challenging themes. Uh, I think that uh, now can uh, show up uh, uh, Silvia Zanelli, that who is uh, our uh, uh, doctorate candidate. Uh, she graduated uh, at the University of Milan with a thesis on Deleuze and Simondon. And uh, now she, she is a, a doctorate student at the University of Bergamo, working on Deleuze and Peirce, so, and on pragmatism and the, the thought of imminence, let's say. So please, uh, Silvia. Thank you very much, Rosella. And uh, thank you very much, Kate, for your interesting uh, overview on the notion of abstraction. And uh, for the collective discussion, uh, please feel free to use the chat and uh, I will introduce you. Uh, so to break the ice, I have uh, for our discussion, a brief note and uh, a question. Uh, so first, uh, the process of uh, re-semantization of the notion of abstraction is strong uh, in Deleuze, Whitehead uh, and Bergson. And I find very productive to, the, to, ref, to refer to the Deleuzean use of the term uh, perversion, detached, uh, of course, from moral connotation. And uh, for Deleuze, from Latin, pervertere um, is a synonym of perversion as an overturn, and uh, of course, not, not uh, of just uh, an inversion. Uh, in this sense, it is necessary not to oppose face-to-face -face the question of metaphysics as you proposed, but to resemantize it from within. Uh, it seems to me, however, that such an operation is not without problems, especially if we adopt a pragmatist approach. Um, it is not entirely intuitive to use the term abstraction and metaphysics in a non-hierarchical and uh, non taxonomic sense. So maybe an ethic of uh, terminology would be needed, as Peirce uh, points out because of uh, the risk of uh, overlapping meanings. Uh, and Peirce, uh, in uh, How to Make Our Ideas Clear, remind us that we have to worry not only of false distinction, but also of confusion of beliefs uh, that are really different. And uh, I think maybe this is the case. 
so under this light, I wonder if using both the term metaphysics and abstraction, according to this new guideline, can be just a terminological obstacle, or if this problem at the terminological level produces misunderstandings which are reflected in conceptual mismatches. Mm, for example, for sure Deleuze is doing metaphysics from beginning to the end of his production, but defining him as a metaphysician creates dangerous and uh, common misinterpretation. Um, I'm thinking, for instance, of Badiou, who reads Deleuze thought as pure metaphysics in its traditional essentialist meaning as a sort of an involuntary Platonism, uh, while Deleuze's effort, uh, as you showed, is of course tied to an internal overturn of metaphysics itself. Um, so perhaps um, I wonder if this confusion um, reverberate in the need to speak of ontology or cosmology uh, rather than metaphysic. Um, and secondly, I wanted you to I wanted you to speak a lot more about the question of space and abstraction in relation to space, uh, because I believe that in Deleuze there are paths in the direction of a new paradigm of uh, spatiality uh, that goes beyond the concept of uh, simple location, um, and that in some way overcomes the fallacy of um, the misplated concreteness highlighted by Whited. Um, I'm thinking, for instance, of the concept of topology, uh, that is the formation without tearing, a movement of folding and unfolding, represented uh, by the famous example uh, quoted by Deleuze of the Mobius strip. Uh, but I'm thinking also of the concept of homeomorphism rather than iliomorphism, and of course of uh, geophilosophy that recur frequently in the Deleuzean production, offering for me an alternative image of thought and of space, uh, conceiving space as pure different, uh, difference um, and as a sort of pre-extensive and uh, intensive singularity. Um, I mean, it seems to me that there is a sort of preferred route for the concept of time um, and the tendency to find dynamism within the temporal uh, while casting space as uh, inert. Uh, so I wonder, and my question is whether it is possible and fruitful in your opinion to rethink and overturn also the paradigm of spatial abstraction, uh, referring uh, in particular to the concept uh, of continuum and uh, of uh, topology. Oh, that's it. Really fantastic um, uh, questions. Um, thank you so much. Really, really interesting. Um, so the, the fir your first question uh, on the, the terminology, of course, Deleuze doesn't have any problems, of course, with using um, the notion of metaphysics. Um, in, in interviews, he's interviewed about this, and he says that he doesn't have any problems with uh, continuing to use um, uh, the notion of metaphysics. He describes himself as a, as a pure metaphysician, as you, as you know. Um, other, other terms like ontology and cosmology, I think also are going to be ready-made ready in ready-made for confusion, um, they're already set up. I mean, this has caused Whitehead, for example, often uses the concept of cosmology. Um, in fact, pro process and reality um, is described as a cosmology. Um, of course, he uses the notion of metaphysics as well, but this hasn't prevented mis um, people from scholars from misunderstanding what Whitehead's up to and what he's doing. Um, I think there's an awful lot of potential that remains still within metaphysics. Um, I think it's true that some scholars have started to use terms like, like ontology. Um, I, I don't see any reason why we couldn't continue to use um, the metaphysical notions of metaphysics um, and notions of ontology. Um, 
Deleuze, of course, says he's still, he, there still is an ontology in Deleuze. Um, it's not simply an overcoming, as you sort of hinted. Um, it's from, it's a reworking from within um, meta metaphysics. Um, so, so yes, I mean, I, it, it seems, it seems to me that the notion of metaphysics itself, itself still has um, the resources within it um, and within the tradition to um, to rethink um, many of the assumptions that come along with you, you sort of describe it as essentialistic metaphysics in, in that year. Um, I mean, this is, I think, what what um, Deleuze does in his in his response to that year. Um, is to show the ways in which um, these um, new ways of thinking are already there in the tradition, in the, in the metaphysical tradition, but have been overlooked. So, um, so yeah, I, I, would, I would defend Deleuze's um, uh, um, defend Deleuze holding on to the notion of, of metaphysics simply because of the resources and the potential within the tradition to, to rethink it. Um, so this, the second question I think is, is also really, really interesting. Um, so, and of course there are, uh, there is, I think you're right, a kind of privileging of time perhaps in some of the scholarship on all of these thinkers at the expense of space. And I think one finds this quite a bit in, in um, Bergson, one finds it in um, Whitehead as well. I think less so in Deleuze. I mean, your examples were, were from Deleuze. Um, and of course, Deleuze, talks about these, these figures, as you say, explicitly. Um, the whole notion of, for example, smooth space um, in a thousand plateaus um, is already developing notions of space that can be, that can be thought differentially. Um, certainly the, the notion of uh, topology and the sort of popular, popularized notion of topological figures like the the Mobius strip and the way that that gets used as a, a figure for um, undoing the notion of the, let's say, the mathematical continuum um, and where the mathematical continuum is understood as a set of externally related points. Um, the idea of the Mobius strip as um, a notion of and, 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 if you like, of continuity and relationality. I think that's certainly present already and explicitly present in Deleuze and Deleuze and Guattari's work. Um, I think it's there in, in Bergson as well. I think it's there in Whitehead. I haven't talked about the notion of the extensive continuum in Whitehead, um, but that would be a really interesting place to go, I think to continue the discussion of the nature of space, space and spatiality in Whitehead and whether there is an opposition between space and time operating in Whitehead, whether there's a processual sense of space in Whitehead. I think that would be really interesting, the notion of the extensive continuum. Um, but I think in, in Bergson also, there's never a simple opposition between space and time, um, perhaps with the exception of the first book, Time and Free Will. But I think beyond that, um, you know, even the notion of, of matter in Bergson is never simply spatial in that kind of fully um, externalized sense as a set of atomic units, um, are distinctly related to each other, right? A separate 
individual units. Um, in the books after time of free will, um, Bergson is at pains, I think, to problematize that kind of oppositional thinking by that sense of a, of a, of, 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 um, of a dualism between space and time. Um, so I think one can make the argument, certainly it's explicit in, in Deleuze and Deleuze and Guattari, but I think it's there in Whitehead and Bergson as well for thinking something like a becoming time of space and a becoming space of time. But you've got to dig, you've got to dig into um, the texts in, in uh, quite a deep way, I think. Because if you if you just stay at the level of uh, the scholarship, you're going to end up with those kinds of distinctions between space and time. But, but Whitehead, for example, is just a, a thinker of time and temporality, and there aren't um, you know really interesting um, differential notions of or topological notions of space in his thinking. But there, there may well be, in the extensive continuum, might be the, the place to go. Does that, does that cover the, at least the, the two points you made there? They're, they're such interesting points though. Um, thank you so much for those questions. Thank you, Keith. Uh, so yeah, I think Maria Regina has another question about Whitehead. Yes, uh, so thank you very much for your talk. Um, I have a question. Uh, it's probably um, a little bit, um, it's, it's on Whitehead basically, but um, it's also uh, provocatory in a way because um, you start saying that um, abstraction is a fundamental process of life. And, and I agree with that. But if I think um, about Whitehead, it seems to me that there are like two different points on the one hand, and I think especially of process and reality and uh, is a very odd um, range of new technical vocabularies, concepts uh, help um, to, to grasp the, the depth of experience. So they are useful. And so abstraction uh, um, are a part of our understanding of experience and concreteness. But on the other hand, it seems to me that Whitehead uh, stresses a lot upon the difference between uh, philosophy and science. And he uh, clearly says in many places, I think uh, even in uh, like anatomy of science and some scientific ideas. So from uh, early uh, that um, science uh, use abstractions while philosophy aims uh, to explain abstraction so um, actually in connecting in connecting abstraction to concreteness to experience so and he um so he says uh if i uh, understood right um he says science aims at abstraction while uh philosophy aims at concreteness so of course we cannot avoid abstraction and concepts, and of course we are aware that they are limited, etc. So uh, how do you think uh, are possible this kind of two option together? And if uh, uh, I'm right in saying that Whitehead thinks that we as philosophers must connect abstraction to experience, so to reconnect abstraction to concreteness. Mm -hmm. Uh, in what um, does um, consist this work of philosopher, this work of reconnected abstraction to concrete, concreteness? Yeah, I mean, what I, so and so far as I un understood what you said, there's some really interesting points in that. Um, I think the, the work, the philosophical work, precisely lies in, um, you know, the nature of the abstractions that he's trying to develop by the nature of um, the speculative concepts that, that he's developing. And so it's really, I think, the, the underlying principle that he um, begins with, if you like, is the notion of, of creativity. Right? This is the, 
the ultimate of, of ultimates, as, as Whitehead puts it. And so the, the speculative claim um, that he's making about the nature of experience is that creativity, if you like, is to be presupposed in all experience. And the work of the philosopher is to, in some sense, show that. And part of the, the problem for Whitehead is that Whitehead um, argues that part of the problem for, with science um, for Whitehead is that science has got caught up in um, abstractions like simple location that have become detached from um, uh, real experience. And Whitehead's speculative claim here is that real experience always presupposes creativity. And of course, the element of creativity that he describes, that I talked about in my paper, is the, the notion of the actual occasion. Um, and so that's the key, that's the central or fundamental element um, for Whitehead of creativity. This is his key kind of speculative concept. So I think that's the idea of, of reconnection there. It's the idea of, of explaining how um, um, what's, being un, what's being disclosed in, sci in science, in scientific experience, has to be connected back up with what's disclosed in um uh through through the speculative work of philosophy um does that does that help maria does that get at, at what your yes what was behind your question no no it's it's okay i'm not sure if i dealt with your question very well there if that was what you were getting at Mm, um, um, well, I, I have uh, some remarks more, but I, I need to, like probably more time to to ask a, a clear question about them. Okay. Um, I mean, I think that, you know, the, the point is that pre, you know, that the notion of prehensions, that concepts feel, they feel elements or aspects in our experience that are abstracted away in science. And the example was, was simple, simple location. Um, I mean, part of what I wanted to argue is that, in a sense, Whitehead, um, still thinks that simple location, as he says, is, you know, a very shortcut or clear cut way to a, a philosophy of experience. Um, and White, Whitehead, I think, is, is much more positive, if you like, about those kinds of abstractions. Um, <clears throat> so I think in, in terms of, um, if you like, a kind of a continuum or a kind of set of poles within pragmatism, um, Whitehead is much closer to what I described as this kind of narrow pole, much closer to ordinary experience um, than say somebody like Deleuze or Bergson. But, um, but yeah, that's the work of, of philosophy. It's connecting up um, tho those those notions of creativity, of prehensions of feelings with the abstractions of, of science. I think Christian has a question and uh, Rosella too. Christian. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Robinson, for this uh, lecture. It was splendid. Uh, you mentioned that the uh, pages from the dialogues with uh, Barney, where uh, Deleuze explains his theory of external relations. 
I am studying at the moment uh, the Lusus Fear of Relations. So this, um, those pages always uh, struck me as uh, uh, because of a thing uh, which uh, the Lusus says, uh, which I think is quite uh, strange because I don't think it is really consistent with uh, the rest of uh, his system. The Lusus says that uh, external relations means uh, that uh, um, the relata are, uh, um, are like independent from the relations and that uh, we can take uh, actually the, the relations away from the relata without their uh, identity uh, changing. For instance, I can take the glass away from the table without the, um, the glass or uh, the table uh, themselves uh, changing, which is something Russell or more uh, actually held but and uh, Deleuze is, uh, is explaining this uh, with great approbation. But uh, doesn't this uh, bring us back to uh, um, a kind of notion of, uh, of substance against which the, the whole of uh, Deleuze's philosophy seems to protest? I think this is virtually the, the only place in, the only place in uh, Deleuze's writings where he says uh, uh, something like that. So do you think it is just a conceptual slip uh, or there is um, some, uh, some way of uh, interpreting these uh, these pages that uh, can make them consistent with uh, the rest of, uh, of his philosophy. Well, that's interesting. Um, I mean, if, if I've un if I've understood you correctly, I mean, from so from the point of view, let's say of the dogmatic image of thought, then external relations are um, so many distinct kinds of units. Right, and this is the, the critique, if you like, that the radical empiricist level at ordinary empiricism is the idea that their conception of the mind or the conception of ideas and perceptions are merely externally related phenomena, um, you know, with no connections between them and so on. But if one undergoes I guess Deleuze, Deleuze even calls it the empiricist conversion in the sense of radical empiricism, then the relations are all connected or continuous, right? Certainly that's the, um, that's the way I've understood Deleuze's notion of the and, 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 which by the way, I mean, it comes up in Parnay in, in the Claire Parnay dialogues, but it's also in A Thousand Plateaus as well, where they come back to this and, and talk about it. And of course, he talks about external relations in Hume also. And the question for him there, I think his interest in Hume is, you know, a, a really a, a question about how, how do all of those external relations become become a mind or become a subject. So, I mean, it seems to me that it's, it's undergoing that conversion, right? The conversion away from, let's say, transcendence to where all of these things are externally related to a thinking from, from the point of view of imminence. Um, does, that, does that get at what you're what's behind your question. I've always thought of what Deleuze is up to here in terms of the notion of external relations is okay. transposing them into, into this other context. No, uh, I agree with you actually, but uh, I think Deleuze is actually contradicting himself in, uh, in those passages. So uh, uh, it, uh, it remains quite, uh, quite strange uh, that admission from uh, from the rules, but uh, I don't know. Maybe it's just uh, as a leap. Yeah, Thank you no, anyway. No, you you might you may well be right. I mean, it, I think it's just from from which sort of point of view one's kind of one kind of, one's kind of thinking about them. But I'll, I'll I'd be interested to go back and look at that. So it's in it's specifically in the dialogues where there's a there's a a, re, a the way Deleuze talks about the notion of external relations, and you think it's um, unguarded and, and unqualified and seems to take us back to 
the sort of dogmatic conception, if I can put it that way, of, of external relations. Yeah, uh, he always uh, holds to external relations, but uh, I think it is really only in uh, the dialogues that uh, he says that uh, external relations means that uh, we can take the relata away from uh, their uh, relations. But um, I think it's, uh, it's against what you explained as the use of the and and then in the, mm. the losses horizon. Uh, but I think your account is, uh, is actually correct. Um, I don't know, uh, my problem is how to make that uh, uh, those pages consistent with the rest of the Lozis philosophy, but um, I don't, your, uh, your answer was, uh, was okay. So well, thank you very much. Follow, you can follow up, we, we can look it up. We can look it up together. If you follow up with me via email afterwards, we can, we can look it up together. And, um, and I'll, I'll take a look at exactly the, the spot that you're talking about and see if I can, I, I can make sense of it. May, but maybe I'll, maybe I'll end up agreeing with you that, that it is inconsistent. <laughs> okay, thank you. So well, thank you for uh, that. It's really interesting. Thank you very much. Maybe it's my turn. Thank you. Um, thank you again. Uh, I, I try to introduce a more uh, pragmatistic point of view through Spinoza. Uh, we know that uh, Deleuze was a great uh, reader and uh, commentator of Spinoza, especially in the fifth book of uh, the Ethic. Uh, we read and it is a phrase um, that was uh, commented many, many times. We make experience of the eternal, writes Spinoza. Uh, we make experience in a very pragmatic sense, in my opinion. Uh, that means uh, when we live, uh, when we get to the third grade of knowledge, to the vision, to the intuition, and we can say maybe to the abstraction in the sense uh, in which you talked about that, we are eternal, but being eternal means uh, to be um, uh, eradicated in the experience, in the experience, and uh, um, to be uh, out of the duration, of the normal duration, and to be, I, I would say, in a very singular and finite praxis or pragmatic uh, situation that coincides with the infinite substance and the infinite and, and the all, let's say, in this sense. Uh, do you see some similarities uh, with uh, what you presented or it's absolutely out of discussion to make this kind of comparison? No, I think it, it sounds really interesting to me to make these comparisons and I'm not a Spinoza um, scholar. Um, I think that the um, there might be more places for connection with um, Whitehead here mm -hmm. and the role of the notion of the, the eternal in Whitehead Certainly the notion of the everlasting is a concept that, that Whitehead talks about towards the end of, of process and reality. Um, it seems to me that um, in Deleuze, um, you know, this, this, is, this is really difficult. I mean, what, what does Deleuze mean when he talks about the notion of the eternal? Um, certainly the notion of the eternal return is um, indifference and repetition at least um, is a fundamental um, key idea that comes up in difference and repetition comes comes up throughout his work 
where the notion of the eternal is bound up with the notion of difference. In other words, what returns is only the is only the is only the different. Um, I don't see that in 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 my understanding, so far as it goes, of Spinoza. Um, I don't see how that would map on very um, very adequately. The, the idea of the eternal return of a difference in um, in Deleuze to the, the notion of the notion of this of of the eternal in Spinoza and then how we go from that to pragmatic experience. Um, I mean, it seems as though in Deleuze the eternal return is there to re revivify or um, revitalize our experience, but it's always the eternal return of difference. And so I wonder if there's a role in there for difference in, in what you described as this connection between the eternal in Spinoza and the way that's expressed as a finite um, practical experience. Um, I, I'm not sure if there's you know, how that, how that would work. The question uh, maybe um, could be uh, this one. Uh, if uh, we are able to make, ex to experience directly the eternal, uh, mm -hmm. are we capable uh, to experience uh, uh, directly in a concrete way abstractions, mm -hmm. as you said? So it's this question of direct. I mean, I, for, I think in terms of the, the three that I talked about, um, you know, I think Bergson would be the closest to that. Um, I think Bergson would probably be the closest because this is the work of, it's the work of, of something that, that we do, um, even though it's a, uh, it's a it's a great effort and a great labor. Um, it's 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 from within our experience, um, from from within our subjective experience. Um, whereas it seems to me the other two thinkers are on the other end of the spectrum on this. Um, that that Whitehead offers a much more kind of indirect set of abstractions for getting an experience. And whereas Deleuze, it seems to me, you know, the subject is problematized, is it's something that we undergo um, in, in Deleuze, right? This is something that um, we, we undergo or we have to experience as a disruption or a disturbance. Um, certainly there's nothing like that, I don't think, in, in Whitehead as such. Um, I mean, what Whitehead, Whitehead does talk about the notion of, um, of making of making substance turn around the modes um, in a similar way to Deleuze. And so this might be this might be a kind of point point of connection with your with your question. Um, you know, a way of a way of um, uh, connecting up the idea of the abstract with something like a, a direct um, experience, but the way, certainly the way I articulated it. Um, no, thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Is there anyone else? 
No, no other question at the moment in the chat. Okay. So if you don't have any other question. We can leave our guest <laughs> with many, many thanks for a beautiful speech and so many suggestions. And uh, um, Enrico, uh, do you want to recall the question of the, um, uh, the certificate? Uh, yeah, sure. There's, uh, we've received plenty of emails about the certification of presence um, for this course, of course. And um, we believe that it's best if you all send the emails with your request for a certificate at the tail end of our course. At the end of it, we will uh, sign and confirm your participation. Right now it's just uh, too hard to handle the whole logistics of it. So it would be better for us to do it at the end of everything. So thank you. Thank you to all. Thank you. Many, many thanks to Keith for the passions and, uh, and to the next, the next time that will be um, the, the, the 7th, the 8th of April. 8th of April. 8th of April. With a um, purse color for the first time. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much to everyone. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.